This is Ben Bratton. He's lived, he's going from, oh, he went from death to old age, and now he's on his way down to birth. Or no, that was your dad. Benjamin Button, right, yeah. yeah. And Benjamin Britton, I was the, comp the composer. I and get, I'm still I the same guy I was yesterday and 10 yeah. minutes ago, and I'm really getting tired of it. So I'm going to let Ben. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Is this on? It's all good? OK. Let and uh, Ben will talk a little bit about his seminar and, and some of his uh, adventures in the former Soviet Union, now known as Prince. And um, I know, these jokes, they don't get them. <laughs> And then we'll have a conversation, and as soon as at least a third of you is as are asleep, we'll stop. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Take it away. So what, okay, so um, um, Jeff just asked me to talk a little bit, of, very quickly, a five-minute introduction, a little bit of what I'm just sort of the facts of what I've, what I've been up to lately. I'll, I'll start with the seminar. Some of you are in the seminar, so you can. Uh, this won't be news to you. Um, so much, but this, the, the seminar that we're working on uh, at SciArc right now has to do with material that's uh, being developed for the next, uh, next book. Um, and it's a, about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, or alien infrastructure, if you like, at um, uh, AI at urban scale. Um, and I, the qualification means at least a couple things. One is we're, I'm, I'm looking at, instead of thinking of AI in the, tra the more traditional um, Turing test model of AI, that AI is something that we might recognize as being intelligent if it appears to perform intelligence, it appears to think the way that we think that we think, uh, then it would qualify as being intelligent. And, this, it, and so we're looking for non-anthropomorphic, non-anthropometric, and non-anthropocentric non uh, models uh, of AI. Um, uh, for one, then we're also looking at the AI at urban scale. Also has to do with a what you may call it, what might call a sensing first model of AI. So um, a lot the more kind of another ways in which the more popular understanding of AI is a kind of mind in a petri dish um, that is that does a kind of pure information processing. Um, uh, separate from other kinds of things. I think one of the things that, in, in reality, that we see is that um, uh, artificial neural networks, the deep learning models that have been the basis for most of the advances in AI in the, in the last few years, are ones that are utter, totally dependent on the input, the input layers, the, the, the information that they get, and that um, the distinction between what, what and how and what an AI senses about the world and in the world. Uh, is utterly indistinguishable from how it knows anything about that world and what it pro how it even processes to begin with. And so the distinction between sensing and thinking of information sensing and information processing is in fact quite cloudy uh, and milky uh, with AI uh, and probably is much m more so for us as well than we had normally uh, would think about. And so this our traditional, you know, our, our these Cartesian models of sensing it down here and thinking up here, um, either that Kant replicates in, in, in other sorts of ways are probably um, due for um, a, a revision. So we're interested then also, in, as I mentioned to Jeff, in models that are drawn from evolutionary robotics. And so evolutionary robotics, um, very quickly, would be, uh, has been a successful form of, of more successful form of, of, of robotics development in which you may have multiple uh, instances of some kind of robotic organism that's able to sense things about its world. It can, it can sense light or heat or surfaces or morphology or something about its world in a particular way. Um, it doesn't need to know much about that world. It doesn't need to have an a priori model of what that world necessarily needs to be, but it may have a, a goal that it's been given, open this doorknob or uh, uh, play this video game or do whatever it needs to do. And through this process of, of, of trial and error, um, and, the in, and the way in which it's able to input information about that world, those artificial neural networks become trained um, in a way that's arguably model-less, um, or the model is, if there is a model there, it's the result of its actual sensed, embodied, uh, trained interaction with that world, and is able to produce um, forms of things we recognize as intelligent behavior uh, that may be operating, if there is a model in there, it's a quite different model than the one that we may have used to understand this, this, um, this kind of process itself. And so 
there's a technical interest in here of thinking about the way that this sort of whole landscape of sensing, sensing apparatuses that we are building into cities that are sensing faces and heat and light and motion and all sorts of other things as a distributed sensory apparatus that is connected to various AIs and in in nested AIs and in different ways and in different configurations that we can think of as a sensory apparatus for the AI, but it's one that's discontiguous from um, a single organism. So if the robotic, you've got one sensory apparatus, one AI, they may, they may be able to share its findings in a kind of neo-Lamarckian fashion. Um, at the city layer, you, you, have a mis you, you may have lots of different sensors and lots of different AIs that may be in different kind of combination, and that, that is an evolutionary development of, of, of considerable interest to us. Um, I guess the bigger, uh, the bigger philosophical question that we're looking at, um, and this is on the seminar we're looking at, we'll be looking at things like machine vision, machine sensing, but also at other forms of uh, non-human cognition, octopus, cuttlefish, crows, and the rest of this is, is we're looking at ways in which um, matter has folded itself into particular ways over a period of time, one of which being the frontal cortex of the of, of bipedal hominids, that it's able to produce an effect that we might recognize as intelligence. And it's done so in a lot of different ways, right? Cephalopods and humans diverged before anything even came out of the ocean a long time ago. And, and more recently, we've, we've, so we've had these forms of animal intelligence, we've arguably had forms of vegetal intelligence, and now we have something like a kind of mineral intelligence um, in the form of AI. Uh, and so what kind of we're interested in at, at a more fundamental level is thinking of this form of intelligence as something that's not, we don't need to model in terms of ourself, we don't need to model in terms of some understanding of our nature, quote unquote, um, but as something that exists in its own right and, and in a certain extent on its own terms. And that so what we will learn from AI is less us teaching machines how to think um, than us learning a, a much a, a little a wider array of what thinking may entail um, by having these other cases and what our particular case may si be situated within that what, that wider array. Um, this as well, and so these are some of the issues that we're we're, we're working we, we've been we've been working through in the seminar. So some of the topics we've been working on around. Under looking at signaling niche dynamics um, within, uh, within urban systems uh, and thinking about AI in terms of the sensing, signaling, and niche dynamics, different forms of non-anthropocentric uh, human-AI interaction, uh, machine vision systems, deep learning systems, and, and looking at this back and forth as well. So that's a lot of what the seminar has been. Um, Jeff also asked me to talk a bit about the Strelko project and this time I've been spending uh, in Moscow uh, so the Strelka Institute, very quickly, uh, is uh, an interdisciplinary school of, of media architecture and design. This is the ninth year of the postgraduate program at Strelka. The, the, original, the first director was, was uh, Rem Kolhas and ran the program for, with AMO for th three years. And then I took over last year and will be doing it for this year and next, another sort of three-year three year cycle. Um, and uh, we have 30... Uh, 30 call them students, but it's really a kind of, it's not exactly, it's a bit of a kind of a hybrid program. The whole thing runs five months. It's a super intensive five months, uh, sort of 24 hours a day, seven days a week, February through June uh, in Moscow. We have a, Arthur Rowing Bear is one of our alumni who happens to be in town, um, which has had coffee with, he'll maybe be, be here. You can talk a little bit about it. Um, Yu Kui, who's sitting back here, is a, our Chinese philosopher of technology, um, who's going to be teaching in our program next year as well. Um, and so the, the participants, it's a bit of a sort of halfway between an educational program and a think tank. Um, and, and we are working on issue, really the relationships between um, uh, emerging, the, in, a very, in a more directions, the impacts of emerging technologies may have on how we define what urbanism is and how we may, would design uh, design in relationship to it. So we're thinking of the of urban form as something that exists at a, the more conventional level of, of the massing of relatively slow volumes and objects, um, but also uh, things that are much much faster and slipperier, slipperier and slower than that particular model. And to a certain extent, we're also thinking about taking the stack model, which I developed from in the book, the MIT book from a couple of years ago, and looking at these interlocking modular layers as a way of thinking about how it is that designers may have different entry points into the question of 
what constitutes the urban and, and, and that could be leveraged in, in, in interesting sorts of ways. The end real goal of the program is to develop des urban design practices um, that, are, uh, that are able to operate in this, this particular interdisciplinary valence that we, that we structured in. And we're of particular interest of working in and on uh, questions of, in, in Russia. And so the program is, is in Moscow. We are right across the river from, uh, from the uh, Christ the Savior Cathedral, uh, the Pussy Riot Church, as it's more colloquially known, right across the river from the Kremlin. There's no, there isn't a sign that says this, but everyone, everyone calls this this as well. Um, this is a specific incident, but the whole thing is a specific incident. The, the site is totally amazing. It's, um, so this was, as, as you may know, was the, um, um, up until the early 20th century, there was a, the original Christ the Savior Cathedral there was one of the main, that, as long as that with St. Basil was also sort of the main um, uh, buildings of, in the Ru Russian Orthodox Church. And then um, during the Stalin era, it was, um, it was knocked down, and it was going to be the site of the Palace of the Soviets. And so the site for the, the giant palace of the Soviet uh, edifice, which would have, would have been the, at the time the tallest building in the world with this giant Lenin pointing into the future at the top of it was to be built here. And they built the foundation for the palace of the Soviets. Um, but then this was in the late 1930s. World War II had, had kicked into, uh, into full gear. And so the, the steel that would have been required to build this um, this palace of, of all things was diverted toward uh, the war effort and, the, and the, the structures you know was never what built. The foundation was there and so it was turned into a giant public swimming pool. And so for most, most of the 20th century, it, uh, it, was, it was this enormous, and I mean enormous, circular public swimming pool that people would come and play in and, and do whatever. And there was later on the pizza parlors and some roller skating and the rest of this as well. After 91 um, and uh, Actually, actually, in the early, early 21st century, when Putin comes back, and um, the idea that a communist autocracy and Orthodox Russian Orthodoxy would actually could coexist quite quite well together, uh, and the church becomes an adjunct of the state uh, once once again, uh, they rebuilt the original Christ the Savior Cathedral on the spot of where the Palace of Israel used to be, as this kind of like exquisite simulation of the original and you would and it you would not know by looking at it that the building that's there is only was actually opened in uh, uh, 19, 1998 it originally opened uh, or, or it was built or something like this and so among the other sort of uh, funny things about the pussy thing is that the building this this grand old building in which this sort of adolescent Oedipal gesture of smashing stuff on the kind of thing was sort of done is younger than they are, younger than Pussy Riot. They are older than the building in which this whole thing sort of took place. But um, I've been writing a bit about this site of late because I, one of the things that's been very interesting to me about the time we've spent in Moscow are these different kinds of layer, archeological, if you like, layers of different kinds of failed, failed utopias and failed dystopias and that have all found a weird way to kind of coexist in different layers, that, that things that we, that for much of the 20th century had been set up as being absolutely, you could, cannot be mixed, that, that communism and capitalism, Russian orthodoxy and a communist um, autocracy, uh, for example, to have to be kept, kept at odds, are actually all amalgamated together um, in a, uh, a bit of a, of a kind of new bad faith a new normal based on this this kind of uh, bad bad faith, I suppose. And whereas we may have seen in the past where this, um, for most of the 20th century, the the um, the traditionalist Orthodox uh, Russian religion and culture had been a kind of suppressed layer in the city that once once things were cleared, it sort of sprung back up again. Now I think what we may see is more like this. It's this secular. Universalism that was uh, one of the impulses of that palace of the Soviets that may have been built there that is that suppressed layer um, within the city and the certain aspects of that of a of a um, of, of a kind of uh, aspirational universalist urbanism uh, that we're actually I think in some ways trying to uh, amplify and bring back um, this is right so this the the reservoir of past futures. Uh, that is thick, and past futurisms that is sort of thickly around you is in, in Moscow, 
um, dead futurisms uh, is the raw material, I think, for a lot of what this program has been built upon in many ways as well. So anyway, those are a couple things I've been up to. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'm going to do this. I want to open the floor now to a few questions about Russia, and if there are any, because uh, it's a curious situation. I might ask one or two. I'd like to spend most of the time on the AI stuff and how it relates to what we're doing here and maybe some other questions. It's the bigger and more interesting question for me. Uh, just, I asked him earlier, how do you find, how did uh, Benjamin find um, the reaction to this cartoonish nightmare of a transformation of the United States overnight with our new presidency and, and its relationship to Russia um, playing out over there? And, uh, and he responded that, you know, I'll, I'll get, maybe I can segue into this with him repeating briefly his response. But if you have any questions about what it's like to be in Russia now as an American and to hear it reflected back or anything like that, um, ask it now. And so I can close the door on the Russian problem and leave, turn that back over to Mueller. And then we can, who uh, <laughs> <laughs> seems to be a good job now since he's doing more investigating of the Democratic Party than the. Republican Party as of this morning's news, so. Who knows? Uh, yeah. Just quickly, how did that, how do you? Yeah, so I, I think you see, I, I, I think it, there's a lot of different takes on it. The, the institute where I'm at is a bit of a bubble, uh, certainly within, within the, the society. I think the, I mean, if you go into bookstores, everywhere you go there, you've got sort of the Russian translations of Art of the Deal next to some Putin biography next to. <laughs> Um, the Trump's book. Trump's book. Deal. Books on Trump. Trump's books. Um, and so you start, and, and then you know, there's other kinds of you know orthodox candles and other things you can mix together. And so the, he's certainly become part of the um, populist iconography. Um, but I think at the same time there's a term, there's a lot of um, uh, uh, I think some disappointment in that he um, didn't lift the sanctions. I think a lot of the interest and in, I think a lot of the support for Trump was both um, uh, more an antagonism towards Hillary Clinton uh, because of the, the, the previous, uh, um, the last elections in Russia, but also was a presumption, presumption that Trump might, uh, might be more amenable to lifting the sanctions and normalizing relations, which he, I don't think he even understood was uh, how to do or that that was even an issue. I, so I think they're a bit dumbfounded by his uh, general incompetence as, as, as anyone else. Um, and and I, I think in terms of where, where I'm at and where we are with, with, with the Institute, I think the people's sense is, is less, is not that there, I think there's a presumption that yes, of course, the Kremlin tried to manipulate the election in some, in, in some kind of way. Um, I think they're more surprised as anyone else that it actually worked. Um, the, in, 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 the, in this way, the, the U.S. and Russia have been trying to, in one way or another, manipulate public opinion, um, whether it's Radio, radio, uh, radio Free America or um, and other sorts of things, for such a long time. And the fact that something as asinine as, um, as, uh, as, as this last round um, would have actually had some kind of effect. Um, I think they're quite surprised at, and and I think also there's probably a sense that yes, there was an attempt to do this, but the the fact that it actually um, ha met such fertile ground, uh, I think I think and I think is correct says much more about us uh, than it does about any of their any of those uh, sort of Machiavellian machinations um, from there. And, uh, yeah. So I think there's a sense that Putin is actually not as power. Anyway, this is a whole no this is a whole other story. But I, I will stop it there. Yeah. Any questions? I have one more. And then yeah, I'll. please. Go ahead. Uh, in general, are they? They feel a right to Crimea. Do they feel a right? To yeah. When you speak oh. to the Russians, uh, they feel like the occupy the the Ukrainian occupation is. Well, you know, one it's it's eleven time zones countrywide, so one doesn't speak to the Russians. Mm -hmm. uh, it's I difficult. Mean, the Moscovites. To, it must have, this as well. I think there's a. I think there's probably. Is that all eleven time zones. I thought it was bigger than that. They have eleven times. <laughs> yeah, there's a time zone gap. We need to make those time zones. We only zones. have four. I know, that sucks. Count we need Hawaii, more time so, zones. Right. It's a. Um, a time zone gap. Um, um, no, I think there's a, a, it's, it's, there's, there's a number of different positions on this as well. I think most of the people that, I'm, that I come in contact with are ones that are 
uh, no, not fans of Putin at all, that are not at all um, enthusiastic about the, the sort of uh, retrograde recid uh, um, uh, uh, ethno-nationalist uh, Eurasian uh, ambitions of uh, someone you know, of, of the, represented by someone like Duke Alexander Dugan. Um, or Putin in any of this sense, in the sense as well. Um, I think there's a sense that you know the, the relationship in the East and the West is something that got that got uh, was the, the potential was really destroyed of something that could have done better really in the 90s, um, and this as well. So I, I don't I I don't honestly don't hear people talking about Crimea mm -hmm. as a particularly sort of this this as well. I, I think in the, if it was in other circles, we might be more. Enthusiastic about this about this point, mm -hmm. uh, I see. but I think it's like Ukraine is a more complicated issue, yeah. right? And Ukraine is one that the east and west of, of the Ukraine and the history of Russia's relationship with the Ukraine um, is taken of this as well. Right? But I do think I think for the most part it's it's in the scene as a um, uh, as is a defensive measures against NATO expansionism uh, into into this as well. So okay, so on the AI, mm -hmm. on to um, to other things, yeah. Uh, evolutionary AI. So, yep. just uh, when I first met Benjamin, he would be on juries at, ahead of his time, so to speak, and he was a sociologist and he was oftentimes speaking in um, economic sociological terms and was sort of a lonely voice and nobody would listen to him. Remember that, like 10 years. It's, it hasn't stopped them. And, no, and then, it's, it's since I was like four. I know. It was, it was kind of, so he would talk fast and he yeah, would speak yeah. in a kind of uh, technical patois uh, jargon. And I, I just made it my business to listen to what he had to say. It wasn't very interesting even to me, but I, I, made, I got in the use of, I could hear him. You know, I knew the technical terms. And all of a sudden, it got interesting. Like, you know, I was at Princeton or something, and all of a sudden he started talking. I said, I know that term, I know that term. And when I said, wait a second, this is now interesting. <laughs> what happened to the 10 years where he was, it was kind of fun to listen to. But, and he just turned into this incredibly interesting commentator on technology and the evolution of society and a reorganization of society. And it's in the digital and then later on data-based world. And then the stack came on. And, so I know he speaks quickly, and I know he speaks with a lot of um, terminology that you have to pay close attention to, but I can I assure you it's worth your while. So occasionally he'll throw out some terms, and if you don't know them, you should just stop them, and we'll explain them. Like neo-Lamarckian, I, I, I'm pretty sure you don't know. Uh, now, if you parsed it a little bit and you remembered your biology, you remember there was a debate between Darwin and Lamarck, and Lamarck represented something called acquired characteristics, and the story went in fifth grade like this. A kangaroo went out and jumped around a lot and, the, and it leaned back on its tail and its tail wasn't big enough so eventually it acquired the characteristic of a big tail. Acquired meaning it acquired it from use and its environment. Or giraffe's neck. A giraffe's neck. Giraffes, they yeah. reaching for they leaves and those, they got the little. You know, they kept reaching for the fruit and finally they stretched themselves into a long neck. And it got debunked by, uh, by natural selection through Darwin and it turns out. But not in Russia. Yeah. Lysenko. This is Lysenko, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it turns out that at a microscopic scale, um, it happens all the time that there are acquired, that you can trace behaviors at, at microbial levels of acquired characteristics and that you can also reproduce those kinds of behaviors when you're using uh, artificial life mechanisms. And so there is a neo-Lamarckian mm -hmm. yeah. component to evolution that he's referring to. And so, so I, I could explain that in the revolutionary robotics context. Let me say, yeah, just a little bit more than I will. So yeah, okay, yeah. when he starts talking about sensate, uh, sensate robotics and evolutionary AI, he may want to refer you to Hume and um, some other writers. Generally, a good way to start for you to think about this, just for quickly for this, con for this conversation, is to think about Spock on Star Trek who was in the Cartesian model uh, in the sense that there was a di complete division between rationality and sensory or emotional experience, and the impossibility of writing Spock as a character. In the end, he, there had to be an emotional and sensory component for Spock to actually perform. And so 
as they kept writing the character over and over and over, he either had to have emotional breakdowns or he had to take break breaks or he played music. And so it just became impossible. And at one point in the show, in one show, there was this discussion about uh, a Spinoza, a really great, um, probably the first of the Western um, philosophers famous for saying, human beings are not thinking beings that feel, they are sensory beings that think. And it's sort of the basis of a sensory mm -hmm. basis of thinking how all thought um, evolves from us being made of matter that senses. And at, at its most extreme level are people like Deleuze and me and Sanford and Benjamin and others who Manuel. have just, yes, yeah. Manuel Delanda, although He's too science-based for me, but he is. He's too, too science-based, you know. You, you know, you are. I mean, if you're, there is a way of thinking of the entire universe as better unfolding its secrets and its mysteries and, it, and its beauties as one giant operation of sensation organizing itself into a kind of uh, no knowledge production, which is why I'm in the art world. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so yeah. when you start to hear about sensory robotics and sensory AI, you should feel yourself in the presence of a thinker moving towards what you do, moving towards architecture, moving towards art. Even if he's talking about new kinds of sensory apparatuses that are detecting phenomena in a more profound way. And I think that's yeah. what's exciting for us about it and why it's located in this school. And so I wonder if you'd pick up on that a little bit and see. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm going to ask you this question. Sure. So are you, is the seminar, for example, it's a reading seminar? It's a bit of, it's a, bit of a mix. Yeah, reading, reading, writing, discussion, project. Okay. It's a bit of but mix. We, yeah, for example, think, yeah. are, are you finding fictions that are picking up on these topics as uh, enthusiastically and with as much aplomb as the sciences that are producing these? None that I really like. Usually we, we talk about fictions of AI quite a lot. Uh, usually critically, right? We'll explain what, what her got wrong or what the new Blade Runner got wrong or what, we, what it got right or this is or this as well. And so mm -hmm. we, we use them as common references um, by which we can, uh, as, as sort of explaining examples, to sort of pick them apart. But uh, I haven't found any that really, I think, quite get, uh, get it right in this way. And I think a lot of it goes exactly to what you're talking about is kind of this Spocky and <laughs> presumption in some sort of way that there's something about um, AI or mineral intelligence that is uh, cold and rational. Let me stop you one second. Yeah. Do you know what he means by mineral intelligence? Here's what it means. Yeah, I'll explain. Go ahead. You buy a $10 chess computer, and it beats you every time you play, and that means a piece of sand mm -hmm. has beat you at chess every time you play. Yeah. And, That's and, mineral intelligence. Right. And so this is exactly right. And so the stuff, you know, all of the, the, the worst thing that we did, you know, one of the other sort of difficult things we're still trying to hang over from the 90s when we get rid of this presumption that somehow computation is virtual, uh, that analog technologies are more physical than virtual things. Computational technologies are deeply physical. Uh, they're physical in a somewhat different way. Um, but it's all table of the elements. It all comes down to a sort of a basic chemistry. There's a basic chemistry substrate to this as well. And certain parts of the table of elements that are primarily organized around carbon atoms turn into humans and cuttlefish and octopus, and other ones that are organized around uh, silicon and other kinds of the, of the metals might organize into the, these um, tracking devices that we carry around with us that are mostly made out of Africa uh, once you get underneath all of the glass. Um, the little bits and pieces that are in there. Sourced which is from, why it's called gorilla growing. Which is why, <laughs> because, yeah. Well, because of, I Cause mean. it's the, made of gorilla. This glass is no, actually No, I mean, the, metal, the metals are oftentimes essential. So uh, what I kind of, to, to get at this is that if we get down to this, um, uh, this sort of really fu fundamental level here, that there's just different ways in which matter, or, matter gets organized that produces kinds of intelligent behavior. So I want to, like, like I think the Spinoza reference is exactly right. Um, is exactly right, that there's a continuity of matter across these different forms. Uh, it's not these hard differences, that this species is unlike this species, or this phylum is unlike these. And there's a continuity of, of, the organ, of, of how the world folds itself into different kinds of, different kinds of forms. And, un, and there's a, a proliferation of multiple kinds of sensing and intelligence that goes on at very, very small scale or very, very large scale. 
and the question is where do, where do we fit into this bigger picture uh, in a way in which we're not necessarily the center of the picture, but we're just a particularly interesting part of the part of this this picture. And, and I think the idea of of um, things sensing other things, you know, the, this things sensing other things at this you know, bears out um, a number of ways. You know, just I was reading, I'm doing sort of more research on uh, uh, evolution of microorganisms over a long period of time. And one of the interesting things is you, you, you discover is that um, the very earliest microorganisms on Earth, the kinds of chemical reactions that they were capable of doing were ones where they would sense the, they could sense the presence of another chemical uh, that they themselves were capable of producing, and so if that chemical that was around them was something was, that there was a lot of it, they would go ahead and make more of that chemical. And so, for example, like uh, microorganisms that make bioluminescence, there's no point in one of these little guys making the bioluminescence if there's not also millions of others doing it at the same time to result in something like light. And then later on, many millions of years later, one of these little guys gets ingested by another one. And you have the eukaryote and the kinds of you know, multicellular organisms that happen later on. It's such that you've got, and once you've got one of those, then you've got an organism where one part of the organism can send signals to another part within the same organism. Make sense? So like your brain to your liver and your liver to your stomach can send things to each other. But from an evolution perspective, signaling between organisms happens first. Signaling within the same organism happens second. And so each one of us, as an organism walking around, we are a kind of complication of, an inter of this in interorganism signaling. And it's, it's this kind of, it, and it's the, the, these sorts of continuities that I'm kind of interested in. Yeah. This, I don't yeah. know if I made it more complicated. No, no, I do want to explain the Neil Lamarckian yeah, thing though, with the ahead. robotics because it's 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 like it's maybe a more direct point to what how do how do I how do I mean this? Um, so as Jeff said, Lamarckian inheritance refers to how one organism may develop a capacity or trait. Uh, I mean, this is the theory. This it doesn't really bear out, but it, it, it so much it does at certain epigenetic levels. But that's not the point. Um, where the, it, it will learn something about the world, a little capacity about the world, and that some way this actually becomes imprinted into the genome of that organism, right? So like that giraffe, imagine the giraffe reaching really, really far for the tree, um, and somehow its neck becomes slightly longer, and now it's got a slightly longer neck, a genome for a slightly longer neck. And so it's not only that the organism changes based on its behavior, but that those changes are then passed along to the next generation. Does that make sense? Which is not how we understand Darwinian evolution to work. It's basically you've got forces that are selecting from the outside that say, these ones can make more babies, these ones can make less babies. But the, the, the new behavior doesn't get passed along. We've, later on, we invented technologies for passing along behavior in the form of language and tools and technologies and writing things down. But that's not genetic. But but the. Um, this isn't sort of genetically informed in this way. Now, so evolutionary robotics, however, does work in a way that's kind of Lamarckian, is what, what I was saying, is that and, and imagine this sort of scenario where you, you've got a bunch of, you've made a bunch of robots, and you want to make a robot that can open a door, that can negotiate the doorknob, and can figure out how to open the door, okay? And each one of these guys has, um, you know, say a hundred layer artificial neural net within it, which is plenty for it to figure out and to and develop a capacity for, op for opening the door. So you s let them all go, and for the first few days, not much happens, right? They're kind of wandering around doing a bunch of stuff. All they need to do figure out is how to open a door and once they open the door. The, basically, the only thing that they get periodically is some kind of reinforcement from you that says you haven't gotten, you're not close, not close, not warm, you know, sort of warm, cold, warm, cold reinforcement learning. Eventually, one sort of gets near the door. And let's say one figures out, ultimately, over a few days, how to open, open the door, right? And in doing so, it gets the positive reinforcement from you in this way. And, and so what it, what it has built up, the model of door opening, if you like, that it's been built up in its artificial neural networks is now a piece of software. It's now actually a kind of, it's now actually a kind of structure uh, that has appeared. 
What it's then possible for that to do is then, in as, is then, if you like, broadcast that solution to the other 99 guys that it's wandering around the room with. And now, once one figures it out, they all have figured out um, how to do this. Right? We do this with language and culture. Uh, uh, but other, but machinic species do it through sharing of, sharing of code. Um, and so if you take the code as being analogous to something like their genome, um, it's a kind of Lamarckian, it is a kind of uh, Lamarckian inheritance um, that's at work here, or at least it's one that's, that's being decided not only by the, the selection of the reinforcement learning, but it's also being decided by this, an, 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 uh, an adaptation that can be passed along. That's, that's what I meant. Yeah, but so, yeah. I, I think this is, yeah. uh, let's, if you don't mind, let's flesh this out just a little Please, bit. Please, yeah. Um, and just as an aside, for anybody that happens to be interested in the neo Lamarckian question, it, and so he described it in robotics. It turns out recently, in the last three years, there's something called, um, let's call it protein epigenetics in which a kind of stretching your neck causes a certain protein formation in certain smaller mammals that last four generations. So they, there is now a demonstration, you can look it up, protein epigenetics. Many scientists think it's the future of a certain kind of research in macrocellular animals. You can look it up. It's kind of fun to read. Just, just to extend that one. To extend this one, but yeah, I mean, I would also say that that we've. I mean, one thing that's peculiar is, and there is interest in epigenetics for sure. There's something to be said about Lysenko if we want to go back. Yeah, one, yeah. we can end with that. Maybe like take it back to the Russia. But <laughs> you know what we we've invented. One of the things that we do, and some other species do, um, but mostly humans, um, we try to leapfrog this process um, with with tools and languages and culture. Right, right? that's I mean, what I want to get to. It's much, fa it's much easier, one thing that we figured out to do that's, that's, that other groups have it, if we wanted to migrate north, for example, it's much easier to build tools to take that yeah, bear's than skin. Yeah, to try to use than to, than to try to sit and wait to grow fur. <laughs> yeah. um, or just to tolerate the cold. To just to tolerate the cold, right? Yeah. And so the idea that somehow, so one of the things, I, I, you know, I, I, I think the, um, <laughs> This cycle. I read this thing in Scientific American. So if we sit here for three million, <laughs> we're gonna sit here for three million. We're gonna wait to grow fur. Um, it's just it's. I weak. guess the big no. thing is it's no. supposed to be gonna be useful for losing weight. So for losing weight, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I guess what I wanted to just just to sort of lead, lead to sort of the uh, a key is is instead of however to thinking about this longer process and, and I think you're getting a sense that what both Jeff and I are interested in are thinking about these and in, in, in uh, a scope of as as part of an evolutionary phenomenon. Um, is, is not just that we, we sort of appeared and then began to use tools to, to do things on our behalf, though in a certain sense we sort of to do this. At the very beginning, we, we, are, we, and by meaning the species, are the result of the technical culture that we co-evolved with. We have opposable thumbs because we, our ancestors used tools. We have binocular vision because our ancestors hunted things. We have less fur and hair because our ancestors had invented tools that allowed us to steal other yeah, anim animal skins. Yeah. And so- yeah, This is right, you're absolutely right. It's not just that, we, so we are your farm and the human that, may, the human that we would, we may have thought of somehow the center of this process is itself the effect of this process. The, yeah. the, the men are wiser the nature, and more. The nature that's somehow at the center is, is, is the result and the effect. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Men are wiser and more talented than, never mind. And um, women. <laughs> I'm gonna get myself in trouble. Um, I don't know why, I don't, I don't know why. Okay, yeah, okay, I do, okay. Yep. are separated from and like either No, 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 because the amoeba today has gone through as many advancing transformations as over the amoeba from a thousand years, a million years ago, as the hominid today did from a million point eight years ago. So it's not just us that did that. Everything that's today has gone through the same filtering and transformational system based on the context in which it's lived, I think. Yeah, but the well, the difference is they don't have 
as big a uh, tactical set of tools like provided by language. There's an advantage to, it seems, to us. We don't know amoeba language, maybe that's not true. But our language does provide us a much more accelerated way, and I'm gonna describe to you why. So for example, there was a Deep Blue, won the first world championship, you know this. And all of the moves, and the way it won that is by giving up an AI approach to chess programming and using what's called a brute force approach. You know, you know this, memory had gotten big enough, speed had gotten big enough, you a chess player? Okay, so if you know this, they quit trying to think like chess players when they were programming Deep Blue, and what they did is they take, took advantage of what it could do well, which was calculate fast and store large numbers. And so it got to the point where at 20 million calculations per second and the storing every calculation, it could beat uh, Kasparov by using a brute force calculation instead of an AI approach. So it won seven out of, uh, it won seven games, or one in, it won by two. And in, but in every move it made, every move it made was considered by chess experts to be a blunt, obvious move. It just got there faster. Except in one game, it made one move that no chess master had ever seen or imagined. And it's the only time so far, yet to today, even though chess computers are regularly playing at world champion levels, that any move by a chess computer has ever reached the level of what's considered chess poetry. This is the one move that has happened at what would be called an evolutionary AI event. And so, but it's still famous for happening, and, but not happening again. So statistically, it was a rare move, but inevitably it will happen again. And so it's an indicative yeah. of the possibility. On the other hand, every bit of practical knowledge we have about the world, what happens when we go up a staircase to our sense of mood? So that we want to go up a staircase when we go into church, and that has been built into the practical knowledge of architecture is also an example of exactly this. It's trial and error built into our experience and encoded in the um, guild language of architectural knowledge. Um, and it's one of those, I would say. And so we have to, what we have to keep doing is collecting both sides of these stories, understanding the incredible power and re-describing that knowledge in this AI evolutionary term and also mm -hmm. recognizing when it occurs in um, aboriginal AI events, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked about the fiction thing. So when you, if you read yeah. Kryptono Kryptonomicon? Kryptonomicon, the Neil no, no. Stevenson novel? No, the first one, White. Uh, Snow Crash? White, Snow Crash, if you read Snow Crash, all he did was took a traditional story and rewrote it in terms of viral, la viral coding language. And all of a sudden you started to recognize very traditional ideas about uh, secrecy and corporate intrigue as if these were processes of data movements. And you began to understand both worlds in very different terms. And that's why I think the fictional issue is so important. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to see the world we know extremely well as versions of evolutionary AI. You know, we need to understand traditional architectural as a subgenre of evolutionary AI, yes, exactly. the, the common law of architecture. That's right. So if we read like, it that like, way, it's like deep learning for humans. Yeah. So we just know, read it and write it that way, mm -hmm. and then when we see what's going on in the real world of that, then it won't turn into another form of sensate science. That's why I was asking that question, and that becomes your job as designers. And you present your projects, but you've got to present your projects in exactly these terms so that it becomes your common language. It doesn't need to be talked again. You don't need to talk about the piano noble anymore and going up and down a staircase and the framing of a window. I, I really think this is what's mm -hmm. important to, and why you have communications, why the experts that come out of the seminar or the tutored come out of the seminar. It's not about not, not knowing that a nanotube could make, a, can make and bend as a sensate uh, micro thing. In a, it can't, it's not the science it can do. It's the evolutionary poetry it can do that can uh, collaborate with the practical knowledge 
to augment the architectural production of more sensation mm -hmm. so that I you can get there. Yeah. And that's right. where I think, that's why this common moment should be really important to you, all of you is that we don't need more science in architecture because the minute science happens well, we in don't know what to do with what we've got. I think well, as a, soon as there is science in architecture, it leaves. The minute we find you out... Mean science of architecture. No, as soon uh -huh. as we learn, like, as soon as we find out how to produce electric light in architecture, electricity leaves architecture. You don't know who, put, who are the architects that use electric light the best. Who are the architects that use plumbing the best? Who are the architects that use insulation the best? As soon as we Bechtel. discover that about the building. Bechtel. Yeah, Bechtel. <laughs> it, it becomes, it leaves because it's such a common, useful effect. Everybody does it equally. So what we, we make our worlds yeah. out of practical knowledge, out of this magic-like stuff, which is what, you, when you talk about sensate AI and sensate robotics. It becomes, I mean, I think there's a certain kind of, uh, Normalization of, of 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 this across the, I think the AI and automation more broadly, right? No one talks as soon as AI. It's sort of a, almost a joke. As soon as AI works, it's no longer AI. Right. That's right. Right. No one says I've got, I'm going to the robotic banker. Right. You go to the ATM machine. Yeah. Exactly. Right? I'm not going to the like the AI door. It's just the open automatic door. Right? It's just the way things are. And more. And, and I think this is the, we do, we, come, yeah. we we don't we just becomes part of the way the world. How old are you? Know, I'm going to be 50 okay. sometimes. You won't yeah. know. Yeah. I, we don't know what it was like to live in a day where you could afford the most expensive car in the world and buy it and still know that in the winter there was a two out of three chance that there was going to be a day so cold you couldn't start your car. Well, I actually grew up in California, so that was a oh, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, or, or it was going to overheat. Because, you know, you yeah, just yeah. don't know what it was like to yeah. know your car was not going to be reliable. Right. You can go to a dump, get a car that just hardly would pass anything and turn that key and it's going to start. You know, there's no such thing as a car that won't start anymore. You know, it just, the problem is totally solved and so it's not even an issue anymore. And that, what he's saying is exactly true. AI is only AI because it's... It's on this border it's still of on actually, the, yeah. it's actually border of working. And yeah. it, it becomes a kind of, I mean, you mentioned Deep Blue. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a different, uh, we were talking about Apophenia and conspiracies and the rest. There's also, yeah. the way Kasparov dealt with that condition, with that, dealt, with, the, dealt mm -hmm. with the situation, he flipped out. Bizarre, yeah. He went crazy a bit and, and sort of thought that IBM must have been cheating and that they were hiding something. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes. And that they were manipulating this whole thing. And he may have been right on a certain level. But I think also the whole thing was set up as a bit of like a... Um, uh, a, a replication of everything's wring with the Turing test of kind of like it's either man or machine. It's always some kind of amalgamation yeah, of all the way down. It's always mixture all the way down. And so the fact that he had discovered there may have been a mixture at work is shouldn't have been a shouldn't have well, been a surprise. He has coaches too. Shouldn't have been a surprise. Yeah, it shouldn't have been a surprise. But um, what you see with the chess thing was you know it was a kind of God of the gaps argument. God of the speaking of Spinoza, um, God of the gaps arguments philosophy is like you know. There's the, and, you know, there it would be, you know, kind of like there's this natural world, and then there's the things that God is responsible for, for producing. You know, yes, we understand how to boil water, but God is what, what causes the sun to come up and go down. It's like, okay, then we figure out why the sun goes up and comes down, and it's actually not going anywhere. We're going up and coming down. It's like, okay, 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 okay. That's, okay, that's natural world, but God is the thing that makes... Um, God is the things that makes puppies fall in love. It's like, okay, well, we figure out that actually there's just a certain kind of neurochemicals in the pituitary gland of small dogs, and that's not, anyway, the, the, the things that we allow that actually are somehow more mysterious, so ineffable, so inexplainable that they must be God gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Basically, same of AI, it's kind of a similar, AI is a kind of a similar situation, right? AI, yeah, you can have an AI uh, you, could have, you, you could never have an AI that would be able to calculate, um, do, do ta calculations faster than a person. And then Babbage does this in the 19th century. Like, okay, but that's not really intelligence. Um, you could have an AI that could do, uh, you know, that, you, that could uh, figure out a firing table. Okay, but that's not actually really intelligence. That's just something else. Or it could never play chess, or it could never play Go, or it can never find pictures of dogs in a picture, or it can never convince you just to do these sort of things. And, and turn, and the, what counts as being AI becomes this increasingly smaller kind of domain, and usually once it does, it's usually said, well, that was never really intelligence after all. And so many of the things that were part of, also I think part of the question of trying to locate to what you're getting, so locate where does the, um, 
where does the unique special case of, of human intelligence and human language culture fit within this larger domain if we were to understand it not as this, we were understand it in a more Copernican sense of not the center of the story, but as a special, but, but as one condition among, among others. Our relationship to these other forms, intel, these other kinds of intelligence and acting upon the world are ones in which um, I think we'll, it, it, your generation, certainly my generation, will, con, will be confronted with the types of things that people were reacting to in much way Kasparov had re reacted to this AI. There'll be things that we thought could never possibly be done by a machine that, that um, whether that's, uh, it, it, that will be done, by, be done by a machine. And I think that the pushback, um, the f humanist fundamentalism that will be the pushback against um, all of these kinds of things as well will be, um, uh, will, will, will be part of the context in which all of this you know, takes place. So, you know. Thoughts, questions? Does that make, does that, yeah. Clear enough. I just sometimes I you you're, I, you, you, you're good. You translate this well. I don't want to make sure whether sometimes I'm no, trying. I mean, to, I, I'm, but I'm trying to speak pre-translated. So. I just uh, I'm even more hopeful than you is. Uh, more what? Hopeful than you. I mean, I don't. I think it's not just the pushback. I think there'll be both the pushback and the and the full embrace. I mean, I, you know, I'm not afraid of machines doing creative things. No, but it, it's my, I'm afraid that they're not. We're not going to ask them to. I'm more. Oh, well, that I, may. I, 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 the, the, the issue. There's more to do with this. I think that the part of the problem with the culture of AI, it's sort of at this point, is we're asking it. it we, is we're not allowing the. We're not asking the AI to do really interesting things. I think part of the reason that, like, the deep dream images mm -hmm. were ones that kind of resonated with people, which was a total accident. We, I met with these guys a couple of weeks ago. Maybe these were not supposed to get out. Oh, is that right? It was a total. It was like it was like someone posted it on Reddit, oh. and then like three days later, it was on the front page of the Guardian, and the Google PR was like, oh, "We're fucked," because they thought this. They thought everyone would freak out. That like. Well, no way. I, anyway. I didn't really believe it. Did you believe it? I mean, I, I mean, think it's true, but that I don't, what? What? What they the producing those deep dream images? What, what What part of it you're, are you not sure about? How they produce it? No, I know what it is, and I know how they produce it. I, I think the consequence of it isn't what everybody's thinking. That everybody's going to be able to read all thoughts and you know. The, no, 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 no. But that it would see the that it would instead of you had a, you had this AI that was capable of complete of psychedelic hallucinations, not AI that was this sort of that was Spock. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, that an was, AI that would that took mushrooms, was right, and, and was like seeing things. That, yeah, but I mean, that, Sanford and, and is so taking the, mushrooms, and, so, and there's not. I can't really tell the difference between him on them and off them. I mean, you know, that's what I'm saying is Sanford. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he's okay. doing all these micro doses. My, well, that's a, okay. This is maybe a, maybe a special case. I don't know if it, I, don't, I don't know. If it, I don't, <laughs> yeah, it is a special case. I don't know if it is or isn't. But, the, but what I'm saying is that is that I, one of the things that I think one of the reasons those images resonated more broadly in visual culture was the idea like here's the AI that's actually like this move in Deep Blue. I think it, maybe you're thinking of the AlphaGo one where it made this sort of different. Here where it's well, there's it's called the movie. Yeah, I don't there's even some, know. There's yeah, something right. in there. There's a form of thinking that's going on yeah. that's a bit like you communicating with the octopus or the cuttlefish. Like right, how, exactly. How were we communicating across this chasm that there's something going on here that there's that there's a form of creativity uh, that may be totally indecipherable, we get alien, even a bit weird and scary that this thing is capable of and that that's great news. But the idea me, that it's capable of making a more rational Human dwelling box. The, See, here, the, the, it, this is boring. It's it's the creativity that's part of this, and of course, yeah. But here's also my, be here's the scary. The thing. It'll also be the scary part. I guess this is what I believe. I believe uh, we, we we've been trying like hell to find foreign intelligence, you know, out, outer space intelligence. There's plenty on Earth. We just yeah. don't. We have there's so crows. We have these. Uh, yeah, we have animals that are 99 percent of our DNA right next to us. We talk to them all the time. This idea that there I mean, will be—I mean, thirty-five percent of your DNA is a ficus plant. Not me. <laughs> I, I hate thick figs. <laughs> okay, and what I was saying is, that, yeah. yeah, right. So it's, it's all around us. Okay, but this yeah. idea that there'll be a para, eventually there'll be a paraphrase translator—I don't believe what there'll be. Is it translated a, into English? Yeah, or translated into anything. What there will be is, no. is already exists. There's a sensation translator, and it's already exists. So. When I'm with my dog, I know exactly what my dog is feeling, and it knows what I'm feeling, and that's his, that's a perfect translation. Or he thinks he does. It, it she. She thinks. <laughs> she, she, she so thinks she does. It's yeah. just when we get to 
No, the, the, the transparent translation, and this is also why I'm very, I'm on this panel in a couple of weeks with the person who runs the uh, Alexa program at Amazon, and I'm actually quite critical of all the ideas that we, that the way in which AI needs to work is to translate how AI thinks into something that is. Yeah, paraphrase, that, is clear, you know. That is just, it is just, we're making it do 99.9%. .9 but I can make my, no, my I, I think Google Home wrong. and I think it's my wrong. Echo sing duets. To, and I, but I can, and I can make them. But to get them to talk to each other, but you if can, I, you get the two echoes together. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I, no, I have a Google them. Home. Getting two echoes together and get them to do stuff together is easy. But okay, but but my <laughs> point is this: is when we understand that there's no confusion, no darkness, no obscurity in a communication that's sensation based, not language based. When we understand that it's fully perspicacious in its own sensory terms, which is what I think. Is one Can of be, the yeah. which may it may not be true, it, but it does. It has. Well, it sounds like it when you're talking about sensory AI. That is, could be where it goes. It is if there's a form of sensation that may be in common. Well, I when think, you keep saying it is a way of getting information, that's when I worry. Getting information. In other words, when these sensory devices, sensory AI could be one of two things: the AI itself is sensation, or it's using sens sensation as a way of. Sensation is input layer. It's the sense, like know, the central nervous. Said. It's like the central nervous what system. What, what, what if yeah. sensation, as Spinoza says, is, is all there is? Is all there is, uh, and then whatever processes it into its own. So it, 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 sensation is the input, and then internally it processes as a, a reorigination into the domain of the uh, execution. It doesn't have to be a paraphrase. No, it doesn't. I don't think it needs to. I mean, now, now he's going. Now he's going too fast. For you, for them. No, for yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 we're no, done. No, no. I just wanted. To, no, let's keep going. No, no. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't. We haven't, we haven't we're almost there. I think. Um, so I, I think one of the things that you're getting, and I think we quite agree on, is that the, is the limitation in, the limitations within the of a common model. Right. As Universal the, translator. As the basis between ways in which communication becomes There's a presumption, in a way, that like the way Google Translate works, if you got something in French and something in Russian, it goes from French to English and English to Russian in order to go from French to Russian. Is that right? Yeah. So you've got a, you've got a model in between that, that's taking a, a description of, of something in one, that in one linguistic structure, a common model, and then a common model. The idea that there has to be some common model by which this could be translated in it is probably wrong. Um, but one of, like I was talking about with those my, those evolutionary robots that have built those that have that sort of mo that model of how to open the door, when this with this as well, one of the things that's that's both um, interesting, exciting, and frightening about the use of these more broadly, if you think of in, in whether it's an automated transportation or automated building systems or automated anything that are based on deep learning systems, is that the model that is ultimately produced, that is. Uh, that is at a behavior level is perfectly functional in its capacity to execute those things, maybe one that even the programmers of the system are incapable of deciphering. That it's actually produced, and that the model that gets produced is not like you can go in, in like a refrigerator and open it up and fix it. Um, it's learned how to do it. It's been trained how to do it. And maybe you're training it a bit more like, like training of a rock into an ax head than training of a dog how to do a trick. Um, but whether there is a model in there that it's even possible to be translated back into a model that we could understand is an open question. It works. It does what we asked it to do, but we don't know why. And it's possible that we just can't know why because it's thinking in a way that's so different than the way that we're yes. thinking that there is no common model. Yeah. And then what? What do you do when the, our, in, our infrastructural system, the urban scale, you, the, the driverless car just stops one you, day at the side of the road? You, you open it up and you're like, wow. You hug it and you, you <laughs> hum and you, you, know, you sense it. You've got questions? Yes, but this, but this is all why, and this is all, and I think what, 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 what is clear is instead of seeing AI as some kind of thing that exists in a realm of pure sort of virtual mind on top of the messy, chemical, sensual world in which we're operating, um, seeing it as very much part of that world in such a way that our own processes and its processes can be understood on terms that are happening and in, in, in through a comparable, comparable logics, even if those comparable logics are not translatable. And it's the non-translatability that's actually maybe the more interesting part.
not, not the seamlessness, not the transparency. So. I got I, it. I think you agree with this. Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was what was wrong with uh, Sand Goes Out and then. Persian Gulf War? No, the, <laughs> the movie that you liked. Uh, the movie that I liked? You know, the creature from outer space puts his hand up, Sand goes all over the place. Jodie Foster was some lady. Contact? Contact. I wasn't not a huge fan of this movie. I was a rival. I oh, wasn't rival. a huge fan either. So it goes like that. Sand goes out. Oh, I, I like the language. I was great until like the, it became a language. What I thought was the language was nice. Well, I don't. Why did it have to mean anything? Why wasn't I'm not that? Sure, just, it did. Yeah, she should have said. No. Wow, I feel no. it, man. That is. Did you see the new Blade Runner? The new Vienna? It's the I'm, same guy. I didn't like the first one. The first Blade Runner. Uh huh. Oh. I didn't like it at all. <laughs> you know. Okay. Uh, what are you? <laughs> All right, where are you going? Hey! <laughs> Get on, I'm teaching come, come you. On up, come on up, come on up. You're supposed <laughs> to say I gotta pee. You gotta ask him questions. <laughs> okay. What? Yeah, over here, yeah. yeah just in your three slides, again, um, uh, explain about how architecture should, should I start? Yes, right. yes I can. Um, because it's happened so many times and you, you have to get used to it. Um, so, Architecture, let's say it this way, Vitruvius wrote in Latin, then it got translated into English, something like that. And when you learn, or... And it's origin of human-centered design, which is the problem we got. We yeah, it's human-centered design. So went wrong from there. Or let's say Newton worked in something called Quaternion. So lots of the knowledge that you have now was first described in terms that you wouldn't understand at all and got taught and got taught and retaught and retaught into easier and easier and faster and faster pedagogies and that pedagogy is related not only to making the knowledge easier for you to use, but also knowledge that related to the political, economic, and, and um, sociological context. So it made sense to you. And we keep updating the way the knowledge is broadcast and embodied. And what I, so what I'm saying is, you can take every way we think about architecture and turn it into computer programming. That's what, um, in a sense, we teach it that way. You know, we talk about high resolution, low resolution architecture, so I can use the language of programming or I can actually use a program. And that lets us relate what we're drawing uh, to what we're producing in a kind of seamless movement of micro metaphors. Is that, you understand that at all? If we started to do that with AI and uh, uh, evolutionary and revolutionary, or, or, spine, or um, um, I'm, I'm, I, I, binary. Could, could I yeah. jump in? I'm not sure that we. I, I'm. There's a way in which we. I mean, there's the history. There's a. I'm not sure that the um, the um, morphology recapitulates the ontogeny quite the sort of. The, 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 I, I know. I, I, I know. There's a way in which we would think and draw and metaphorize and make allegories and move models from certain levels of abstraction to another level of abstraction to mm -hmm. another level of abstraction. I think there's absolutely ways in which um, algorithmic systems can be proposed that will go through similar kinds of operations. But whether or not we need to train them to think like we think, in order for them to do that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not so well, sure that that's a precondition, or that that's even well, desirable. Just, so, for example, in this novel, Snow Crash, have you read it? I recommend it. But it's uh, a kind of early history. It's a, a VR and AR. It's a kind of invents a whole kind of world around that's based on VR and AR from the, uh, and it's like 20, 20, 25 years old. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's he looks book. at yeah. the history, like of the Jewish religion, and he looks at the Jewish laws, you know, kosher, all the laws of Judaism that are ancient. And he reads those as laws of uh, how to defragment and keep out viruses out of a computer. computer. And that that's how the software of Judaism stays um, pure and continues to proliferate. And it's a, an incredible thing. So he looks at the biblical laws of Judaism and he, make, he makes you aware that they're analogous to software um, up, up, uh, you know, maintenance. And he does the same thing with corporate culture and corporate finance. And so it's quite amazing to read that. And then you start to realize that the same kind of thinking 
is also produced the software and also produced the hacking culture. And so you become cognizant of both and you, you start to move between these. An isomorphism is when the history and the software that seem totally opposite or not connected at all, when they're connected and you can move seamlessly between the two of them, your intelligence doubles. because you, So you can solve a problem in one and then move to the other, or you can solve the problem in the other and move to one. So that is a standard um, axiom of mathematics. If you can solve a problem in algebra and then you connect it to geometry, and you don't know how to solve the problem in geometry, but you can solve it in algebra, you can then solve it both. That's what Carti the Cartesian system did. So anytime you can have two systems that are isomorphic and, uh, and you can make the connection, you gain the power to move back and forth between two. And that's a system, that's a way of approaching everything I ever tried to approach. You, take, you try to find discrete, non-related systems and find out that they're isomorphic. And that's what I was trying to say is the, once yes. you go from uh, binary AI to sensate AI, you introduce the entire possibility of connecting it from not scientific knowledge, but from, to practical knowledge, because practical knowledge is sensory based, or matter is. Okay, so uh, if, if I follow what you say, is the isomorph is not between necessarily um, a human metaphor, model, met, models of metaphors that would allow them to perform to do the behavior necessary, no. necessary to design, and the other half of the isomorph being the way in which an AI would run through no, no, similar no. operations of metaphors to do the sort of no, thing, no. which is, I'm, I'm just sort of rehearsing my, yeah, the, no. the, it, it, which would be a more the more popular way in which AI is understood. We're gonna model the mind, no, no, exactly model not. human decision making, and then we will teach symbol, this symbolic logic to the machine and it will figure out the no, question. Exactly the not isomorph that. is not that. The isomorph is in fact between is, I totally agree that we, the, the, this movement of multimodal abstraction is the basis of intelligence, but it's, it's more to do with the sensation exactly, and the practical behavioral sensation yeah. in relationship to the world that if there are AI systems that have common capacities for sensing, that's exactly right. then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what models that's it's working exactly on. That's exactly right. That's why you don't worry about that. It doesn't matter what the models it's you working just, on. All okay. you're working on is the, is the uh, ever increasing the fineness of sensation in both conditions, so that's it. But I do think it's important that we get out of the realm of the incremental growth of the technology and into the realm of speculations. It's yes, a, yeah. but there's also, why, just on the, my concern about the use of AI, I'll just go back to this sort of dissect and locating both AI within the architecture culture and architecture culture within the, this AI. Um, to, to the extent that we're looking at an amplification of AI, is like here's the way in which architects have done things, here's the workflow, here's the supply chain of architecture, and we're gonna find out points within this existing supply chain which we can optimize or accelerate with, uh, by moving, by algorithmic processes. This is, um, this is incredibly boring. This is not it, what is interesting about this at all. What's interesting about it are the ways in which we can collaborate with these other forms, these forms of inhuman pattern recognition and form finding uh, that we're not necessarily always piloting, but that the con communication with that we back and forth and the, the symbiosis that we have with those tools might allow for forms of world making uh, that, are com that are perhaps completely different than ones in which we've operated with, operated with before. Yeah. Would you agree with this? Yes, I think completely. I, okay, okay. But for that reason, I distrust, you know, when you say, I'm not surprised, although I didn't know this. I, and the reason I ask you this, because I mean, I think you're sort of, here's, there's this history of architecture, there's history sort of things like, and there's a sense perhaps that, there's, that there was something inevitable about this continuity. Uh, and, and um, I, 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 I want to make sure that they're not confused, that they don't take, they're not misinterpret this as saying is that, the, is that it's simply an, as sort of adding AI to this continuity as well. Oh, no, we need no. to sort of go for it. And I make sure that they don't see this. Okay. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Um, you. Um, it has some sort of a cap, for example, 
the the AI of the of the chess players w cannot get better. It, it'll get to a point that and it is at the point where it is at the top level, and there's nothing it can go for an AI uh, chess machine. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I think what you're what you're getting at. What we're. I mean, the simple term distinction would be important to sort of make would be a distinction what's called general AI and, and, and AI. You may have a chess playing AI that is quite good at, at, at salt, that we, we can communicate with this AI, in fact, through this bounded conversation of the chessboard. Because it's this extremely thick space of, of, sim, of, of, of symbol exchange, we can actually communicate through in this as well. But you ask that AI to take abstract its knowledge of chess and position and territory and strategy to parking, yeah. And it may have no idea how to even do this. And more general AI, which you're beginning to see more and more with, does have this capacity for what in neuroscience is called multimodal abstraction, where like moving from algebra to geometry, mm -hmm. you can say, OK, here's some general, in addition to my expert knowledge, I'm actually able to produce some abstract principles of how spaces like this might work. And you could take chess, and you could apply it to movement of troops, or uh, drug design or uh, Busby Berkeley choreography. It doesn't, it doesn't, we, like we can take and move across, a, a general AI would allow to do this, and to certain extent, that's, that's where a lot of more interesting research is at right now. So just in terms yeah. of where that uh, limit but is. I think is right, the, yeah. the point, and I think it's funny, the, the, the parking lot question, the yeah, parking yeah. that you're referencing, because um, it's true when, when you were saying that, that we don't see an architecture about lighting anymore, like who is doing the best lighting, and in some way, I feel like I'm interested in knowing and understanding AI and architecture together, like in terms of an evolutionary standpoint, like in some sort of ways, we, we would start seeing the lights go, like the light architecture, architectural light maybe go, we'll start seeing parking lots leave, we'll start seeing all these things that uh -huh. in some sort of way architecture is evolving too. Um, but in, at the same time, I, I, I find it hard to believe that because I don't think architecture will be able to evolve to the point in which it, it can choose between, for example, form, shape, or figure. Um, and I think what, what's important about that is that it, it, in some sort of way, then it, it suggests is what is architecture really evolving to and what, what is it evolving towards. Um, and I think in, at the same time, if, if architecture and AI like start in a way, like if our, our AI starts trying to produce architecture and trying to produce the perfect architecture, if we could imagine so it to do but or not. I don't think anyone's suggested that. But, but uh, wait a second, I do. Uh, every s architecture is one species in, a, in an, a giant, robust ecology of creative production. One thing I can guarantee you is every species goes extinct. But that jungle, bigger than an ecology, the ecological economic system of that jungle will live forever, but not all the species in it are going to go extinct. You know, is see, architecture the species or the jungle in this case? It's, a it's species. the species. It's, it's, species, it's, it's of a form, species of form finding and form making. Yeah, and yeah. most of the architecture that you know and think and study is already extinct. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, the architecture that we're producing today is about 50 years old, and all the architecture done before it is totally um, extinct. Got nothing to do with anything to do. No building that was built older than 50 years ago today applies at all in terms of its cost, production, materiality, organization, infrastructure, services. So when when electrification, internal electrification occurred and finished in 1968, that totally transformed the entire architectural environment. And when digital architecture production and manufacturing occurred, that totally transformed it again. And you're looking at a, almost a brand new species. This is a young practice. And so, we, and so I say this in my class, it's kind of a joke, no one quite understands it, but one of the most important inventions of the 20th century in architecture was the ROM plan. All the ROM plan is today is an absolute guarantee of being sued. <laughs> Don't do it. Because anybody doing looking at their iPhone, which is 10 times more interesting than any effect a ROM plan can produce, is going to get, is going to fall, going to break their neck, and going to sue you for making such a stupid section. So just don't do it. So you have to be blunt uh, about your discipline. Don't romanticize it. You want to keep it alive? So, so just on the, I just, I, I want to 
You, don't, you disagree? No, I, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I, I want to maybe specify the further in relationship to, to the, some of the things that you said during the question, if, if I might. I, I don't think, uh, I think it would be, a, what I'm trying to argue for is that we want to think about AI, what this AI would be, not in relationship to things like a kind of absolute instrumental perfection of the form or, 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 or the, these sorts of uh, kinds of idealizations, but go actually going to much more durable kinds of questions like light, like how senses, how surfaces react to light, worms react to light, fish react to light, things, you know, certain ways in which vision may appear, and to do sorts of in, in kinds of things about signaling and niche, things that are in fact a, a much a more fundamental yeah. language and a more fundamental set of concerns that probably will be the basic. And let's build back on up from this sort of a, 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 a new set of set of elements. Um, to understand how, how this would work. And so it's seeing AI as part of a, uh, a almost as a, a, you know, it's not biological, but seeing as if it was part of this kind of biological process, and we'll, have, we'll be able to have be, uh, engage these things more, more properly. So this question of light, for example, is, is, is actually incredibly important, right? Because a lot of the way in which AI and architecture work together will have to do around forms of synthetic vision. And you have set, you'll have surfaces and sensors that see light and process light it's in ways that are quite totally different, that are quite differently than the way that we totally. We, of yeah. course, it's already happening. But this is what I'm saying: is like let's these, this, is not, this, is not, this is not this is not this is a really kind of a, I, I want to see this not as some kind of like um, yes, it's already happened. But so do you like I think, art? I think I made my point. Yeah. Do you like art? Art. Yeah. You like painting? What's your favorite most recent fresco? Well, I, I think I, I don't. I don't think I, don't think I was interested. Abraham. I mean, this is the, it's the, it's the simula it becomes the simulation. Well, but what, what he's yeah. talking about is, for example, I think you know. Yeah. This is something like you'll never see a Jasper Johns as long as you live. You'll never see a, an encaustic painting by Jasper Johns. No, I, but you no, know, I, I think we do. It's like the idea is not using AI to somehow make a better real savoir. Or to, to I know, well. but what this I'm saying is not know. the point. It's not the point. Yes, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, yeah. I mean, that, but I can think of incredible <laughs> things you're talking about where whole disciplines that were dead or whole opportunities are gone, come back again at, at the stupidest level of what he's talking about. Like light production that doesn't ruin a painting but lets us see it for the first time. I mean, there's all kinds of ridiculous stuff. So mm -hmm. this was going to work from the plumber level to the most incredible imaginable level at all. It's but. Don't be ashamed of the plumber level. No, not at all. No, no, because this, these, these are the issues where, and this is what I was joking about Bechtel, but I think you do have these big kind of, yeah. you have these come, sometimes these big industrial. It's just we're not going to make any, we're not going to be part of the plumber level because we're not smart uh, enough. I, I do think a lot of the most, interesting, the most interesting work in this area is being done in an area that we would normally dismiss as being industrial architecture. Yeah. And because we're not um, smart enough when, when the billions of dollars it would, would go to those people, they're not going to let us in. They say, oh, you guys are too smart and artists. You need to go over and make $100 a day while we make $500 billion a day mm -hmm. with these AI plumber devices. You know. Well, a pl a AI plumber devices, that's the Tesla factory. Yeah, it's, uh, or it's, the, it's the group that these are the AI plumber devices. Yeah, the these chip you put on your ear that saves your life yeah. and everybody around you life. So, yeah, like, so in that case, like AI is automation, right? Is like, yeah. it can AI out is what? Automation. automation. AI is automation? Yeah, well, like there. Is that the question? Well, I think in the discussion, what you're talking about right now, like what Bechtel is going to do with these sort of AI things is to put us automate. Down. Yeah, put us they're gonna, work. Like they're going to use AI for automation in the same way that. Maybe, no, I, I, in a, at a tool level, if you're looking at AI on the desk, desktop, so to speak, possibly, though it's probably Autodesk that will get there faster than other, other people. If that's what you're, no, I meant more that like if you're interested in looking at. Um, more contemporary architecture that is dealing with the, that's taking the, the circulatory systems of the biochemistry of the site in ways that are less interested and less focused on the, the phenomenological experience of individual human consumers of the space. You should look at, you know, large scale, large scale agribusiness. You should look at battery factories. Yeah. You should look at um, things that Bechtel makes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bechtel is, for example, I mean, I, I'm not saying that they, we should, no, do, we should, do, a right. we should do a coffee table book yeah. of the, the, the works of like, here's a, here's a, like a, 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 yeah, the hydroelectric they, plant. They, what's the, the, the and this is what, because in a way they're actually working at, 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 at uh, they're working at these sort of things as well. And so going back to 
Now, they're, for the most part, they, their approach is, is, as you know, is not particularly speculative. It's not, it's not particularly whimsical uh, in terms of the attitude and the relationship and the, and the exploratory practice by which you think to do. But there's no reason that um, the kinds of, quote, engineering problems that they're solved with couldn't be dealt with uh, in ways that are more imaginative, that do take them on as, as, as forms of, uh, uh, as part of the way in which the world senses itself informs itself and develops those systems. It's just we're, we're, um, the, we're not having that conversation. So. I, yeah. I, I, we got to quit, but I tell you, okay. don't, if you don't want to be replaced in the future by a robot, have a job. Plastics. <laughs> don't be like him. Uh, be like me in the sense that <laughs> if they say, should we build a rob, robot like Benjamin, and does the robot mean like me? Yeah, like incredibly fast, learns everything, goes around the world, communicates well, or like Jeff, you know, kind of mean, loses his temper, can't remember what he was talking about. They'll say, why bother with Jeff, you know, and then they leave you alone. Like if you do anything that's kind of valuable, like if you pick up trash, they're going to replace you with somebody who can really pick up trash every day. Like if you do anything really valuable for the world, you're going to get replaced. If you do something kind of tell stories to children, mm -hmm. yep. sort of sh show up, you know. No, this is basically you look at all the studies that jobs most likely to be replaced by automation. It's the ones that are the ones that are, there was, was like, no, the, there's like four there was a study was there's four factors like having to do negotiation negotiating with people personal attention to people dealing with ambiguous circumstances and does the job require you to fit into small tight spaces <laughs> <laughs> yeah if yes you're likely to be automated so <laughs> yeah yeah you yeah yeah so oh, come up here you're the guest. <laughs> Welcome, by the way. Oh, I, yeah, this was. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask a very uh, simple question because at the very beginning, uh, ben Benjamin was talking about um, the, the the history of technological development could be seen as a history of co-evolution between human and techniques. Now that's what the point you have made, and I think that is well understood from the point of view of anthropology. Now, if if we talk about AI. Um, what do you perceive to be the pos this process of co-evolution? I mean, is it pro-evolution? Co-evolution. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you you start with that, and with AI, how can you how can we perceive this process of co-evolution to be? Right. Uh, because where I understand uh, where what you want to say is that you want to reject this kind of thesis, for example, from uh, Hubert Dreyfus by saying that's what computers cannot do or what computers still cannot do. Yeah, the drive You want to the reject argument, this right. kind of proposition by saying that, well, there are some creativity that we don't understand and you may be able to yeah. achieve uh, many things even we cannot do. Uh, but as I, I'm wondering is that the question here is not about what computer uh, can do or cannot do because there is no way to speculate on what computer cannot do because yeah. we can never say yeah. what they cannot do. Yeah. But isn't there, at the very beginning of the genesis of intelligence, there is already a limit? So that is to say, can we talk about the limit of AI, not from the perspective of what they can do or what they cannot do, but from the very modality of their intelligence? Now, when I, make this, uh, when I ask this question, um, I make a reference to uh, Dasson's uh, creative evolution. Right? And if you remember well, and there was a very interesting passage, of course, he compared, he asked, what is intelligence? And he related intelligence to the question of geometry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, yeah. so we can see that there yeah. is a kind of correspondence between... Yeah, Chatelet uh, and... Uh, and, uh, and I think yeah. for in, uh, in the context of architecture, that is even more interesting to think about the relation between intelligence and geometry. Mm -hmm. But this is a very... Uh, thi but this also means the very limit of this uh, form of intelligence by through the geometrization of matter. No? So the question is, if I can, uh, yeah. I, I well, it would be true for it would be true for the. I mean, the the any kind of intelligence, regardless of its substrate. Yeah, as, as a limit, it would be true for whether the substrate well, is, is animal, vegetable, or mineral. This would be the limit of this capacity. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, what, what I will never agree to that. Never. 
Sorry? No, what I, you, don't, I don't know which one we're yeah. disagreeing with. Okay. Yeah. No, no. So, I mean, what he says is that, you know, the, 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 the relation between in, intelligence and, and matter is that intelligence, or, intelligence always trying to, or, or it, I put it in this way, intelligence is based on the geometrization of matter. So you're always no, I understand trying what to you're saying, but you believe in such, you, Possib you, possibly, you I, are I, I, in, in a way, you are, you Chatelet, it's just a Chatelet yeah, but you believe in the, the idea of a, that there is a transcendent status of geometry, like Husserl. The origins of geometry, you believe tra geometry has transcended its substrate. A very important point. I understand, and a lot of no, evidence the, the, is the, the, I think that this, I, I would say there's more that the substrate itself, there's geometric limits to the capacity for the substrate to I believe to fold, geometry to, to be folded, is a right? radically yeah. parochial, species-specific, artifactual form of sensation. Nothing has geometry but humans. That's what I believe. Now, you know Gordon Pash? Remember Gordon Pash? Yeah, Gordon Pash. Yeah. I thought you would. <laughs> Um, and so you know the co-evolutionary arguments he, would, he wanted to make, just like yours, very similar to yours. It's, a, it's almost impossible not to believe this idea because geometry seems so universal and so um, transcendent. And yet, we find no way to communicate with it or about it. Nothing, even though we see it in everything and find it everywhere, we are, it never becomes fungible in any situation. But neither does language oh, or neither does math. Song, or, 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 touch, food. These are, f f f those fun are fungibles to every other, <laughs> every other I don't know. kind of matter. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, but I don't know that they're more fungible. Uh, they're more fungible than geometry. No, I don't know. I, maybe, I, I maybe let me finish my question. Oh yeah, yeah okay. please. No, no. And then I, I also, but yes, go ahead. But yeah. maybe yeah. Well, I, you have course, to buy me dinner. Of course, geometry is a transcendental in the in, the, in that sense. But if you refer to Husserl's, well, yeah. it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. I the really acoustics know. in here, the geometry of the God acoustics damn architects in here are, in there, but are the acoustics. Come up here. Because of so, the geometry of the surface. Is it better now? Can you hear? Okay. So, for example, you you know you refer to Husserl, but uh, of course, if you look at uh, what Husserl really re what Husserl has said in the original ge geometry, of course, the geometry has a transcendental it's a kind of transcendental status, but it also needs kind of experience, which when Husserl talked about that is about measuring, polishing, and so no. on, so right. forth, yes, which is beyond the transcendental status of geometry itself. Now, the point that what I want to make, the question I want to ask is that. Uh, if we want to still talk, uh, as what you said at the very be beginning about co-exist, uh, sorry, co-evolution, yep. in from what perspective can we talk about that? Can we talk co-evolution uh, from the starting point of the limit of AI, or what will be the starting, uh, the, the 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 entry point that we can articulate this question again? Is it clear? Yeah, yeah. I think so. I, I I would say that I I. I um, we, I think we get in. We I'll, I'll concede well in advance, and I think it actually is, is actually a predicate of the argument that I would want to make that there is no one form of AI that we would have this relationship that, that there could sort of to be um, that there isn't an, an AI, and that we would have a a coevolutionary relationship with AI. AI is a, is is like cancer. It's sort of a name that we give to lots of different phenomenon um, that may in fact have very little to do with each other, and so. The kinds of relationships in the plural, the, the co-evolutionary relationships in the plural that we are already um, having with the types of phenomena that we identify as being AI are, are kind of already, some of them are, are maybe quite amazing, other ones quite uh, dull and, 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 and insignificant. Some of them may be predatory relationships, maybe prey relationships, maybe symbiotic. They're going to be any number of kinds of things. Some of them may directly affect us physiologically. Other ones may have really only to do, you know, may have second order kinds of effects. So I don't think it's... Ah, come on. That's such a no, good... It's the, that's what? a political answer. It's not a political no, no, answer. No, no. I'm Hang saying it's that the kinds of effects... Let me translate his question. No, to... oh, okay. No, the limits of what we mean by the limits of the AI. You're talking about the... If, if the AI is understood to be essentially the limits of computability, 
then we may know something about the limits of computability. Yeah, we have Church Turing thesis to, and to understand what the limits of computable okay. systems may be. If that's where we want to go, the limits of this as well, then it has to do with the complexity structures right, of the problem. But that's a very, it's a different kind of revolution. Yuk, yuk hui. Yuk. Yuk. Y-U-K. Y-U-K. Yuk. Yuk. Yuk hui. Hui is his last name. Yuk. Yuk hui. This is Yuk hui. So yeah. I want you to a, listen carefully. It's a fantastic book on Heidegger in China that you need to read. All right. I'm going to try to translate. I'm going to try to restate your question, your position for the audience. And if I make a mistake, I want you to stop me. And this will be our last very smart question. OK? Uh, so you ask um, Benjamin ben. about uh, the evolutionary AI in relationship to a very important concept that you're going to recognize called coevolution. So he's asking, what's the status of AI in relationship to coevolution? And as part of that question, he posits the possibility or the question is, does that not imply something like an abstract condition of geometry in the following way. So coevolution, I'll give you, I'll do it by example because you'll know it. So everybody knows that there's such a thing as an orchid that has evolved in relationship to a wasp so that the wasp fits exactly to the orchid and the orchid fits exactly to the wasp. The wasp thinks it's having sex with another wasp. The wasp thinks it's exactly. So the two cannot survive with each other. Without this big misunderstanding. Yes. yes. The wasp thinks it's in love with the orchid. The orchid thinks it's in love with the wasp because the wasp thinks it's another wasp and the orchid thinks it's a... So, you get it? So, in, in fact, the wasp has become the sex organ of the orchid. So they have co-evolved together so tightly over time that it implies that there's this virtual existence of a geometry, abstract geometry between the two of them. Is this correct? And that that's where the implication of an implied artificial intelligence would be. That's his question. Am I qu close? OK. And what I'm saying is that the coevolution can and has occurred without ever producing a virtual ideality. You don't need, and there is no suggestion, that there is a virtual ideality that needs to be computed for that existence to happen. And that's equal to what Benjamin is saying is there's so many kinds of AI, but more importantly, I'm saying in principle that it's all coevolutions and all material evolutions are intrinsically parochial, intrinsically local, and whether or not uh, qubit, qu uh, quantum computers, can ever calculate into the future possible coevolutions, they will never enumerate all possible matter coevolutions yep. because it's an incalculable possibility. So that's what, it's my opinion now and your opinion, but I wanted to state the problem correctly because it was a brilliantly asked question and I think crucial for this discussion, but not simply a matter of how many coevolutions are possible, but in principle, not, not, I think, not in principle, a well-formulated supposition of the existence of a virtuality, just as my position. Okay? Okay, thank you very much.